welcome all of you almost several weeks we discussed in depth about one dimensional nmr right from rudimentary concepts to interaction parameters multiplicity pattern chemical sheets the factors affecting chemical sheets and how do we get multiplicity pattern when one proton is coupled to groups groups of other protons etc we analyze lots of one dimensional spectra of proton carbon and various other heteronuclei based on the multiplicity pattern we could get lot of information how do we make the assignment everything and also we could extract the coupling information from up to between two abundant spins coupled spins abundant to rare spin dilute spin from the we analyze the satellite spectra from the satellite not only we get heteronuclear coupling we also got homonuclear couplings and then we extended this uh, analysis further we understood afterwards about spin echoes what is the spin echo how does it happen i said two 90 degree followed by a delay with another 180 plus a delay it was a conventional spin echo sequence and the han echo was 90 tau 90 was the tau was the thing which was first given by erwin han a spin echo it's a time reversal experiment and we understood how the uh, spin echo works and we also understood what is the j modulation what will happen to the spin echo sequence especially when we have homonuclear spin what happens when you have a heteronuclear spin whether chemical when chemical shifts gets refocused when j coupling gets refocused or not all those things we understood we extended this further for the polarization transfer experiment we, where we saw that we can transfer the polarization from abundant spin to rare spin like dilute spin proton to carbon phosphorus to rudium phosphorus to proton to nitrogen like that and then we can use all these methods not only for polarization transfer but also for identification of different carbons attached to different number of protons based on the whether the carbon has attached to CO1 proton, 2 proton or 3 proton or quaternary carbon using inept experiment we were able to identify them. We can use it for spectral editing especially for carbon 13 and the same polarization transfer is used in depth experiment I told you where and I said in using depth experiment we can identify different carbons also. So, with the J modulation we understood APT, depth, inept all experiments we understood of course depth and inept are polarization transfer but apt is not it's only a spin j modulation experiment but all these things can be utilized for identification of different carbons plus polarization transfer so a lot of things we understood about 1d nmr and we spent several hours on that and now it is time to go for a advanced experiment advanced subject called two dimensional nmr where we can use this method for further simplifying the experiment or further simplifying the spectra for aiding the analysis of the spectra getting more information which you cannot get from the one dimensional spectra. So, a lot of things one can do. So, we will start from today two dimensional number of course, two dimensional there are several experiments there is also one experiment called 2D NOSI I will introduce before that a concept of NOSI. So, I have not include introduced yet but I am going to introduce it later but right now we will start with the 2D experiment ok with this let us see how it goes. We will ask a question what is 2D NMR and why it is needed? This is the first question we have to ask what is a 2D? Why do you need 2D NMR? First we have to understand the limitations of 1D NMR. <laughs> what are the limitations of 1D NMR? Depends upon the size of the molecule. What happens? So far we analyze only small molecules, small organic molecules spectra small small molecules for heteronuclear spectra etc that is fine. But what happens as you go to bigger and bigger molecule take for example, a big protein uh, consisting of let us say 10 or 20 amino acids each amino acid running from CI3 to NH proton so many protons will be there each of them form a spin system so many peaks will be there and they will all be overlapped and the proton spectra will be within only 0 to 10 ppm range then what will happen? so many peaks overlap so complexity it is very difficult to analyze the spectrum. So, what it means as the size of the molecule keeps increasing the number of transitions and the complexity of the spectrum keeps increasing of course, assuming the symmetry is not there is symmetry if the symmetry is there higher symmetry then what will happen is number of transitions get reduced spectrum becomes less complex <coughs> that is well known. But basically you remember for the 1D NMR there is a limitation for the size of the molecules as the size of the molecule keep becoming bigger and bigger spectra becomes very complex that is one limitation. 
Second assignment problem is due to spectral complexity. So far we were analyzing the spectrum very easily. I used to say that CA3 proton, CH2 proton, CH2 is a triplet because of CA3, CA3 is a triplet because of this, all those things we, we, we were able to analyze which is quartet, which is triplet, this is quartet because of three protons, equivalent protons and this is triplet because of the two equivalent protons, all those things we knew and we are able to ascend. This is a straightforward easy way of analysis, this is a straightforward analysis, simple analysis. This is possible only when the spectrum is not complex and well dispersed. If you go to a simply bigger molecule, slightly bigger molecule with an enormous overlap and spectral complexity, you cannot make the assignment in so easy way because they are each proton, let us say one, I showed you one example of a, a case where one phosphorus was having four different coupling and gave 90 peaks. Like that there could be enormous complexity in which case assignment of the uh, uh, peaks for a particular chemical equivalent spin is a very, very challenging task. And next, next is it is not possible to separate the interaction J and delta. Be remember chemical shift and J coupling will be present both simultaneously in a 1D NMR. I took 1D NMR spectrum and when we analyze we say chemical shift here but that is also having multiplicity pattern because of J coupling. So, both are present you cannot separate them in 1D ok. So, it is very, very difficult job one because when you separate these two interaction your spectrum analysis becomes easy there is a lot of you know simplicity will be spectrum is there in the spectrum. So, this is a big issue and this is one limitation and you cannot correlate the inter interactions. For example, if I want to say CA3 proton is coupled to CH2, how did I understand that based on the multiplicity. I know this CA3 is a triplet because of CH2, CH2 is a quartet because of CA3, I know multiplicity, I can correlate. If there are enormous complexity there in the spectrum, how do you even extract the multiplicity pattern? How do you do the correlation? not easy. Let us say one proton is coupled to several other protons in different groups with different chemical inequivalent protons and there is everywhere there is a overlap. How do you identify that? So, which is coupled to which is very difficult to correlate. So, these are some of the practical limitations of 1D NMR. Continuing further, there are forbidden transition which you cannot detect in 1D NMR. I told you selection rule is delta m is equal to plus or minus 1 change in the magnetic quantum number between two spin states either should be plus 1 or minus 1. Anything above that or below R 0 is they are called forbidden transition in MR and you cannot detect it, it is not possible to detect. So, that is one for limitation. Another thing is simultaneous detection of different nuclei is not possible that is another very interesting thing. For example, if I want to take a 1D NMR spectrum of proton. I have to tune the probe and you know do the experiment at let us say 400 megahertz spectrometer at 400 megahertz I will put it I get only proton signal. If I have to do carbon 13 NMR in the same spectrometer I have to do some changes like I have to change the frequency of the probe and transmitter receiver tune the probe everything it is not easy you cannot get everything so easily you have to do some changes and then see the carbon 13 signal. But both simultaneously you cannot detect I will say at the same time. I do one experiment where I get carbon signal and uh, detect carbon and also proton not possible to do. These are all limitations of 1D number. It puts you some constraint. So, how do you overcome this and first of all what is 1D? Okay. Limit after limiting uh, understanding limitations of 1D NMR let us see what is a 1D NMR means. We have been analyzing all along since several weeks they are all 1D NMR one dimensional NMR. What do you mean by one dimensional NMR? This is simple experiment which I told you to apply radio frequency pulse and start collecting the signal. Oh, this is called a dead time delay you do not worry this are all not discussed in this course, but in the previous courses I explained this. So, this is a, I apply radio frequency pulse and start collecting the signal as a function of time. And then after collecting the signal what we do is we do the Fourier transformation. When you do the Fourier transformation what you are going to get is spectrum like this very simple. This is a conventional one dimensional NMR apply radio frequency pulse collect the signal and do the Fourier transformation and here you have the intensity and what you have here chemical shift frequency ok. okay. 
or in other words i can you know in a short way i can put it like this there is a delay here this is called a relaxation delay before you apply radio frequency pulse after putting the sample in a magnetic field you have to wait for some time or after you apply a radio frequency pulse before you apply another pulse you have to wait for some time because the spins have to come back to thermal equilibrium they have to attain equilibrium only then you can apply another pulse to get maximum signal and this is called a relaxation delay the spins take some time to relax and come back to thermal equilibrium and that i call as also as a preparation period i am preparing the spins to get the signal this is called a preparation period okay where spins are allowed to relax and attain thermal equilibrium and this is where i am collecting the signal is called a detection period it is called detection period and now you understand one thing in this 1d nmr experiment what we have is signal is detected the one time period and you do the fourier transformation and you get the fre frequency that's all so what does it mean one dimensional nmr means you collect the signal in one time domain do the fourier transformation and get the frequency spectrum this is a one conventional simple one dimensional nmr then what is a 2d nmr a general pulse sequence for the 2d nmr is given like this what did we saw here one thing i wanted to tell you here you must understand we have a preparation period and a detection period there are two things which are present in 1d nmr go to here as always there is a preparation period that is a period where you allow the spins to come to thermal equilibrium fantastic then we are going to have we are we are have another time period called t1 is evolution period another time period called detection period it is called t2 we have a mixing period in between these two called some optionally we can use it whenever we want for some specific experiments okay and after the preparation period i am going to apply a pulse p1 a pulse some 90 degree or whatever the angle i apply rf pulse here then i will allow the spins to evolve evolve with time spins are evolving after 90 degree pulse what do you mean by evolution spins start undergoing evolution because of chemical shift j coupling etc where precision can be there spins there could be free precision after the pulse because of chemical shift and j coupling okay and then what i am going to do is this time i don't keep it constant i can systematically vary it every experiment i keep this one constant and then collect the signal i will go further and here we have a mixing period i will come to this later i will explain i have a mixing period where information is transferred from one spin to another spin there is the information is relayed taken from one spin give to another nuclear spin and apply another radio frequency pulse this is called a detection pulse we apply to detect the signal like then you start collecting the signal like we did in 1d and do the fourier transformation now this is a constant period no doubt but this one is not a single period this is one experiment i keep this t1 constant do one experiment what i will do i vary this t1 for some value small increments every time i keep increment i rip collect the signal uh, increment is collect the signal uh, apply pulse increment apply pulse collect signal increment this by some other value do this like that n number of experiments i do every time i increment this and collect the signal and i'm also collecting the signal at this place whenever i increment the every time when i collect the signal what is going to happen i can create a time domain signal analogous to this one this is what happens you see it is like this diagrammatically this is what is happening look at it very carefully this is a preparation period evolution period and mixing period and detection period mixing period can be absent i don't need to use it that is optional i am preparing i am allowing this spin to prepare then i will put some delay t1 i'll collect the signal initially delay is zero no t1 i collect the signal i increase t1 by some value collect the signal increase t1 by some value see here it is moving 
and then collect the signal. I keep on doing this. I increase it and again collect signal. See, look what is happening. Every time increasing the evolution time. What is happening for this one? That is constant. Detection period that T2 is constant. I am not changing that. Only T1 period I am changing systematically. And then I collected the signal. So, T1 is incremented systematically and the signal is collected for each T1 period. Okay. Now, how you look at it? Picturally, you can see like this. This preparation period is constant. Here, I keep on increasing the time and I apply radio frequency pulse and every time I collect the signal. This is always constant. This period, I am not incrementing. Look at this one. Here, there is an increment in the time. Evolution period is incrementing. This is how we collect the signal. But what will happen is, how do we get the 1D signal in T2 dimension after each T1 increment? This T2 period, I am keeping it constant. I told you, I am collecting the signal in the last one. This is called T2 period. This is called T1 period. There are two time periods. This is evolution period is called T1 and detection period is called T2. Remember T2. T2 is constant. Only T1 is getting varied here. I keep, I keep this constant. Collect it. Do the signal. Now, increment the T1. Collect the signal in the T1 do the Fourier transformation, there are some phase distortions. Increment, do the Fourier transformation like this. Different T1 periods, I collect the signal. This always kept constant, but here you, you see phase is getting changed. Different T1 period, started with the 0 millisecond, kept on increasing delay and every time you see the phases are changing. What I am going to do is, I will do a trick. I will take any one of the signals here. For example, this carbon this proton I'm sorry. and then measure the intensity and phases of that particular uh, peak for all the T1 values and plot it. So, for example, take this one. This signal is positive, neg half negative, neg negative, 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 again a positive. So, it starts with like this. Intensity also is changing. It starts with negative, goes positive, it changes, intensity changes. So, there is oscillation going on. What is this oscillation? Similar to this one, decaying function, oscillatory and decaying function, time domain function which is decaying and typically if you collect not 1 or 2 points, about 100 to 120 to 500 to T1 points will do, collect a single data file and then what is going to happen is we create an FID in the T1 dimension. It is pseudo FID, artificially we create an FID for each T1 period. If you collect the signal and do Fourier transformation, we get a series of 1D spectra like this. A series of 1D spectra for each T1 point. But look at it now, intensity. Is it not oscillating? It is going like that. It is an oscillatory function. Okay. And then this period is always constant. Here it is another time domain. As if you are collecting the signal and do a Fourier transformation for series of 1D, you see it is an oscillatory function. And this what is the phase of the signal is systematically changing with T1. That is what is happening here. All right, we will go further. We will see the plot of the signal intensity for a peak as a function of T1, how it is going to happen. And this is an interferogram. This signal oscillating here like this is like an interferogram, time domain signal similar to what we saw in the T2 period. Okay. It is what we did, we created a pseudo FID. A pseudo FID is created similar to FID which we have collected the signal in the T2 domain. So, what did we do in the 1D number experiment? It is a one time domain point, single Fourier transformation, single frequency spectrum. It is a one dimensional number. When in the other case, we have two time domains. Then what we have to do? We have to do Fourier transformation for both the time domains to get the frequency domain spectrum. That is what I explained to you when I explained 1D NMR. Since we have two time domains, we do, do two Fourier transformation, you get a two frequency domain spectra. Remember, one time domain, one Fourier transformation gives one domain spectrum, that is single domain NMR spectrum. Two time domain, double Fourier transformation, you get two frequency domain spectrum. That is what is going to happen now. Look at this one, how it happens. 
we collected the signal like this that is what I showed you this is a t, t 1 point. Now, I will do the Fourier transformation along this axis which axis for the f 2 axis f 1 is still a time domain point I get frequency here here it is time domain I will go, for, go further I will do the Fourier transformation both in this dimension and in this dimension this is a t 1 dimension this is a t 2 dimension also called f 1 dimension f 2 dimension frequency 1 and frequency 2 also called omega 1 or omega 2 whatever they also called direct dimension and indirect dimension this is what the nomenclature which is used ok. So, but now what I did is I collected the signal did the Fourier transformation first in this dimension and then afterwards I did the Fourier transformation in the other dimension also then we are going to get frequency spectrum in both the dimensions that is interesting we got the frequency spectrum in both the dimensions this is a two dimensional frequency domain spectrum you got the point is a two dimensional frequency domain spectrum we got it then how many dimensions we can have in NMR so far I told you about 2D NMR two dimensions how many dimensions you can have like that we can have any number of dimensions but there is a limit for it for example consider this one I apply one pulse collect signal in one time domain and do the frequency in one, one domain you get one dimension NMR this is one D NMR one time domain one dimensional Fourier transform one frequency domain transform Fourier transformation you get one domain frequency domain spectra this is one dimension. So, one time domain is one dimension we go to this one it could be homonuclear heteronuclear does not matter here I have one time domain T 1 here I have another time domain T 2 there are two time domains I this is called two dimensions dimensionality in NMR is different time periods different time domains you can have one time domain here uh, one dimension time dim uh, dimension for uh, as a function of time other dimension as a function of time like that this is one dimension this is two dimensions go further you have t 1 here t 2 here and t 3 here this is three dimensions this is 3 d NMR three dimension gives rise to 3 d NMR. So, what is the what defines the dimensionality in NMR now you have already understood with this whatever I discuss the meaning a pulse sequence in an experiment which we I ex going to explain I am going to explain soon a pulse sequence with n time periods if you consider time period say t 1 t 2 t 3 etcetera they are all explain given like that t 1 t 2 t 3 they are all different time periods. If I have a n time periods with n minus 1 incremented n minus 1 systematically we increment to create a pseudo f i d and then only one of them is kept constant one of the dimensions. So, after the after of the n time domains n minus 1 is incremented only one time domain is kept constant this gives rise to n dimensional spectra. So, dimensionality is defined by the number of time domains time periods you have. So, t 1 t 2 t 3 etcetera you can have n number of time periods and you can as well have two dimension two dimension means two time periods three dimension means three time periods 4D means 4 time periods. Of course, you can extend like this beyond 5D and etcetera is very difficult because signal will decay. You, you, theoretically, is different, but practically, you cannot have more than 5D or 6D, etcetera. 5D you can have, but beyond that, it is very difficult. So, you can have different dimensionality in NMR. You understood what is the dimensionality? Dimensionality is defined by the time periods. So, what defines the dimensionality? If you curve, go further, I am sorry. A pulse sequence with n time periods gives n dimensional data time domain data pulse sequence with n time periods gives n time domain data and you do n dimensional Fourier transformation you are going to get n dimensional frequency spectrum understand the logic now you can have a pulse sequence with the experiment different pulse sequences with there are n time periods you get n dimensional time domain data you do n dimensional Fourier transformation you get n dimensional frequency spectrum 
and this is called NDNMR, N dimensional NMR. You understood what is the N dimensional NMR now? So, N can be anything, N can be 2, 3, 4, 5. If N is 2, you have 2 dimensions, N is 3, you have 3 dimensions, okay. And how do you get the uh, 2 dimensional spectra? Just for an illustration purpose. We can have different type of experiment called resolved experiment, correlated experiment like that. I will as we go ahead, I will discuss all those things. Resolved experiment, I will resolve 2 parameters in 2 different dimensions. Correlated experiment, I will correlate 2 information in 2 dimensions. But this is a type of spectrum, you see, you are plotting the spectrum. This is called contour plots, no, I'm sorry, stack plots. You are plotting this one dimensional spectrum like pattern in different stacks like this. Different uh, stacks are there, stacked one above the other. This is called a stack plot. This is the way people used to do the NMR, record the NMR spectrum when the 2D NMR was discovered in late 70s or early 80s. Soon it has been replaced. Now this type of representation of the 2D data is not done anymore. Just I am trying to tell you there is a, this was the way it started with, it is called a stack plot. But now what is the way it is done is called contour plot. This is a stack plot this is a contour plot. Same thing is represented as a contour here. Can you see any difference here? Look at it, this peak is put as a contour, different circles, one within the concentric circle, several circles are within that. Look at this peak is here, this strong peak is here and these four peaks which are the stack plots, see several number of spectra are there here, you see, Num they are plotted like this. So many one dimensional spectra like that are plotted and the same thing I put as a contour here. This each contour corresponds to particular peak in a stack plot and this is F1 dimension, omega 1 dimension or indirect dimension, F2 omega direct dimension and all the time nowadays you do not represent the signal or I am sorry spectrum in stack plot, everything is a contour plot. So, what the 2D NMR you are going to record, the spectrum of 2D NMR is nothing but a contour plot, it is a 2D spectrum. It is nothing but this one transformed into this. Then you may ask me a question, how can I transform here to here? I will give you an analogy, try to understand this. How do we translate stack plots into contour plots? Okay. See, look at this one. I have a stack like this go to the bottom, it is like a mountain, steep mountain, go to the bottom, go one round, measure the area and put a circle, this is a contour, go slightly above in the mountain, go slightly above, go one more round, measure the area and this bottom area is circumference is much more compared to the next one, put another circle which is within this go slightly above, measure the area, put this within this, go slightly above, put it like this, go above like this, like this and what we are doing? We measure the area of this contours at different places and convert it into a contour like this. So, the contour is nothing but the area of this peak, if you take the area of this contour, it is nothing but the area of this peak, that is all. It is just imagine a steep mountain, at the bottom you go one round, put one circle, go slightly above, come back one circumference, put, measure the area, put one. Like that you can keep on going to different heights. Every time we measure the, go one circumference, measure the area and put a circle like this. This is how we translate a transform with stack plot into contour plot. All right. So, the area of the contour provides the integral area of the peak, that is all. This is how we convert a stack plot into contour plot. Now, the question is what is the time constraint in high di higher dimension NMR? You may ask me a question, hey, I want to do a 2D NMR, 3D NMR, 4D NMR, but you should understand before doing any experiment, what is the time constraint involved? How much time it will take to do an experiment? Based on that, you have to decide your experiment. Say, for example, 1D NMR nowadays in the present day spectrometers is less than few minutes, 5 minutes proton NMR, 10-15 minutes for carbon-13 NMR like that. 
forget about exotic nuclei like nitrogen 15 etc it will take more time if it is lay not labeled but by and large one dnmr with like uh, nuclei like uh, fluorine phosphorus and proton they are very fast if you go to 2 dnmr it may take several minutes they are 25 10 15 20 30 minutes like that go to 3 dnmr it will take several hours if you go to 4 dnmr it may take days if you go to 5 dnmr it will take several weeks that means if you have to do one experiment you have to spend several weeks and what is the cost of the nmr instrument cost of the nmr instrument runs into several crores 800 megahertz may be about 15 crores when such a so much of money has been invested nobody will give you if one week or two weeks or three weeks to do an experiment so it is the judiciary you have to decide depending upon the information you want to derive whether you want to do higher dimension experiment or not so there is a time constraint so measurement time increase exponentially with increasing in the dimensionality all right and also what will happen as the dimensionality the, the measurement time increases sensitivity also decreases it goes by square root of the measurement time sensitivity goes by square root of the measurement time and dimensionality also depends upon the size of the molecule you cannot take a, a small molecule and do 5d nmr what is the use of that if you want to do a n dimensional nmr multi dimensional nmr it depends upon the molecular size for example a molecule size of let's say few few kilo dalton 20 to 30 or so just 2d nmr will do around slightly more than that 30 40 50 3d nmr slightly above 40 or 50 4d nmr if you go to 50 60 80 and 90 like that you not only you need 4d nmr you need additional experiment like deuteration trosy etc so dimensionality of nmr depends upon molecular size also so increased information will be there when you have increased dimension because of increased resolution that i am going to explain so how do you choose the required dimensionality for any given molecule etc we will discuss in the next class right now since the time is getting over i want i don't want to continue further but in this class we started with understanding what is a 2d nmr what defines dimensionality i said dimensionality is defined by the time an experiment a pulse sequence with n time periods with n minus 1 incremented n only one time and domain is constant is going to give n dimensional nmr we have n time time periods n dimensional fourier transformation you do give do and you get n dimensional frequency spectrum and most of the you can have any different we have representation of the 2d data it was stack plot and contour plot stack plot is outdated i showed you how we can use the uh, contour plot contour plot area of the contour nothing but the integral area of the peak in the stack plot so we can use that and of course dimensionality of nmr depends upon how much time constant is there i explained to you 2d nmr may take few minutes 3d nmr may take few minutes or let's say few one or two hours three hours two hours like that 4D takes days, 5D takes weeks and also resolution enhancement and sensitivity depends on what is go, goes by the square root of the measurement time. So there are certain restrictions also involved in this thing So it, and also depends upon the molecular size that also I explained to you. So how what is the size of the molecule you have to use for getting the dimension, different dimensionality but the question is how do you choose a required dimensionality for a given molecule that we will discuss in the next class. Thank you very much.